Okay, sorry. <laughs> I went live and then realized I was still on the phone with Nikki Reed, and so I had to hang up so that I could actually have the live stream work. And I think Nikki is going to be joining us in just a second. Um, but hi, everyone. <laughs> just waiting for Nikki. We've poured some tea. Oh, look at all you guys. I haven't, this is the first time I've done this since quarantine. So let's see if Nikki's here. 2000. Wow, there's already 3000 people in here. <laughs> oh, look at all the hearts. So sweet. I wonder if I'm gonna have to call Nikki back. Oh, she's texting. Okay, I said unpaused. Nikki just texted me. <laughs> We're not tech savvy at all, so you're gonna have to give us a second. So, Quests. Oh. Oh, look at all the questions. So cool. Okay, Nikki said she's requesting. Maybe you guys can help me. Hmm. Oh, I see Nikki. Okay. Are you requesting? I just see Nikki said hi, but I don't see your request. Oh, God. Yes! Oh, my God. That was the worst thing ever. <laughs> what just happened? Don't ever leave me alone with technology. <laughs> I know. I thought I was that, like, that was... <laughs> I have no idea how to do this. <laughs> we did it. I've done one or two. Now you've done one. Here we are. That was a nightmare. Tea was a good idea, tea outside. All right, we're here guys. All right, hi. Hi guys, let's see. There's so Evan and I, full transparency, we FaceTime a lot. We do a lot of FaceTiming. Yeah. And the other night we were sitting on FaceTime talking about 13, which we don't talk about 13 a lot when we- No. Now it's mostly like, gardening and like herbs yeah herbs. Like, hey, how much do I water my calendula yeah exactly <laughs> and I was thinking you know maybe it would be nice to I don't know we did one of these like five years ago and or longer now actually um yeah about six or seven years ago yeah oh that hurt yeah seven okay and um and I don't know we just thought maybe we'll Maybe we'll pull it together and um, dive into some memories with all of you guys. So there's hi. Still, there's still such an amazing following for this film. We were talking about that too. It's like the one that is the one that's not going away. That really is going to stand the test of time. Although I have to say, did I tell you this? I did. Um, I we did like this kind of survey thing recently, which I'll, I can talk about later. Um, but we were asking a bunch of 13 year old girls, like a hundred of them in a room, if they had ever seen 13 and not one of them raised their hand. And it was the first moment I realized like, like we're old. <laughs> not one of them, you know, for a while I could still like, kind of like slide by thinking like, okay, I'm still kind of cool with the youngsters because maybe they've seen 13. No, all the, talk they've about all just grown up now. Yeah. Yeah, our uh, 13 else. crew is all all grown up and we all have wrinkles and we all have gray hair and... But I feel like there hasn't been another kind of version of this. There's been mm. similar, but like it really, 
it was just so real. And I think it's, it's even though, you know, times have changed and social media and everything is, is different. And so the film would be different. It was, if it was made now, the themes in it are still, I don't think those are ever going to go away. Yeah, I have to get my head in this in the like right headspace for this because I think I've spent we talk about this, but like I've spent a long time kind of <clears throat> because that film is so special to me, but also there were aspects of it that were so painful as well. Yeah. Um, I have these weird memory blocks uh, where I kind of like I remember the experience as a whole, but to really dive into it and kind of like chip away and uncover and remember um i have to put my head in that place yeah but, your head um, must have been spinning while you were filming that so many different things going on for you while i was filming and then after and then really it was like the years that followed um that i just could never have anticipated and, and i'm sure for you as well like the ripple effect of that film was just oh yeah so the life was never the same after that movie for sure and our friendship and we can talk about that because i think it's actually such a sweet love story <laughs> how it all came back around um but for so many years we lost touch and yeah and kind of lived our sweet. own lives and you know strangely is, had yeah. some parallels also yeah we um, did and then came back together as as adults to form this totally new fresh but super special friendship mm -hmm. so I have a lot of questions that I um I mean I have questions too but I also have a lot of questions from this little um post thing that we both put up and um I kind of love I love well first of all thank you guys so much for um all of your really special thoughtful words and comments and questions, but also um, so many of you always talk about how this movie uh, changed your life and it changed our lives as well forever. Um, but it's so special to see uh, that something that we were a part of, you know, could have had that kind of impact and maybe in some small way changed the course of I don't know, the relationships that you had with your parents or family members or somehow informed some kind of decision you were making at the time that um, it's just really, really special to be a part of something that is, I guess real is the right word because it was real enough that it was able to cross over beyond just an hour or two hours of sit sitting in a movie theater. I mean, people took this film home with them, with their families. And I do hear still, um, even, you know, 15 years later, 17 years later, um, that it's, you know, through the course of like their high school experience or their college experience, or even, um, you know, a part of like their careers, uh, this movie went with them, so. Mm -hmm. I think I wrote about this um, when I went through a really dark time later on in life, like in my 20s, and I went to get help from somebody. And after we had kind of gone through, you know, whatever I was going through, and it was time for me to leave. She said, I didn't want to tell you this at the beginning. But the reason that I have this job and that I chose this line of work is because of 13. And I mm -hmm. wanted to help people. And I thought, I can't believe this movie inspired you. And now you're here helping wow. me. You just, you just see how what you put out into the world kind of comes back even when you don't realize it you know and just how much of an effect it had is there a part of you that feels like because I feel like this sometimes because again it was lightning in a bottle it was like the combination of everything and everyone that came together in that moment made that movie what it was and you needed all of those pieces but I do feel like there's a part of it you know the parts that really uh got into people's hearts and souls I sometimes look back and I go, oh, well, that was me and Nikki's pain. <laughs> you know, there was so much in that movie that was real. Yeah. And we were allowed to put it on screen and to be so vulnerable with it. And sometimes I look back and I go, yeah, yeah, we gave really good performances. But it was also we were just able to access this part of ourselves and this this kind of wells of grief that we had had even as teenagers and just let it out. And, you know, I think about the success of the film sometime you know, equates to how much pain we were actually in at that time in our life. It's, it's, it's odd. It's a weird feeling. 
Yeah, that's one of the weird things about art. Um, you know, strangely, I feel like that, that, that definitely was part of my experience. But I think that for you, like, as I listen to you talk while you say that, I feel like I see, I lived a life where I was very much allowed to express myself and be that kid. Um, and you see that very much in like, you know, Tracy's character that like, she's super outspoken and her relationship with her mom is, you know, um, there aren't a lot of boundaries there. So I was, I was that kid that was allowed to, to put it all out there like that. And I right. think for you, unless, and I don't want to speak for you, but I think for no, no. you, because you had already been working as an actress for such a long time and you had so much you had to hold in. And even at such a young age, you had to already be somebody, maybe for yourself, maybe for your mom, maybe for the your, world, yeah. your, the world, the crew on set, whatever it was, you had already been like, train is not the right word, but you you were so perceptive and you already knew you couldn't release right. that. So 13 yeah. was like, I feel like I got to see so much of you, the friend that I knew, the Evan that I knew when you stepped into Tracy and then that would kind of go away. Yeah. When they yelled cut and you were, you had to be Evan again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like 100%. Evan. No, I think that's, that's very accurate. That's very accurate. There's a lot. I mean, that's why I loved acting so much is because I did feel, you know, there's things, in, you know, in my personal life, I won't get into it. But yeah, I mean, there was for sure that pressure to be perfect. And because I was successful at such a young age, there was the pressure not to fuck up, you yeah. know, and, and um, it was also in the era of, you know, child stars and child stars gone wild. And it was kind of that was like the hot thing. And everyone was just so concerned with, you know, keeping me safe. And I think sometimes it has the slingshot effect, you know, but <laughs> But 13 was therapeutic <laughs> for that reason, because certainly yeah. at that time in my life, I had no idea that I, I had even been harboring some of those feelings until I did that movie and I was given permission to feel them. And that's when I started to realize that I, what, I, you know, I did have grief that had gone unchecked. And Do you, you remember know. when we were laying in the bed? Do you care if I tell this story? No, no. <laughs> <Is that> okay. <laughs> we should start every <laughs> sentence with. Do you care Everyone if I tell this story? That and <laughs> <laughs> or that, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Do you remember when we were laying in bed and you said, um, I said, wow, you can just cry like that? Like whenever you, <laughs> whenever you want, you can just cry. And you were like, yeah, do you want to see? Do you want to see? <laughs> and so, <laughs> this is embarrassing, sorry. No. Okay. And so we were laying there and really I just wanted to listen to you sing because you had such a beautiful voice <laughs> and uh, it somehow turned into me saying, can you make yourself cry? And you can like, you show yeah. me how to cry? Like, on, yeah. Yeah. And so you just, you looked at me like with such a deep, crazy wisdom, like no, you were not a 13 year old girl. You like looked at me, you looked into my soul with your eyes and then I just watched and it wasn't like an acting job. I mean, when, when I say it and I'm laughing, it sounds like, you were just acting, but it wasn't. It was you kind of looking at me as like a, your, I don't know if it was your first, but like such a like powerful, raw friendship that was very new at the time, but also yeah. was so, I, I can't even explain it. You looked at me like I'd known you for a thousand years and like you were giving me all of your pain in that moment. And just these tears just started pouring down your face. And I was like, wow, there's so much in there yeah. that needs to come out of there. And that's what I feel happened in 13 in that whole filming process for you is like you finally got to release yeah a lot that was in yeah there. I don't remember I mean you were saying there's parts that you don't remember and I don't you know I've told this story before but I don't remember filming the last scene once we got into the kitchen I just completely it's like everything just went white and then I just remember waking up in the bed after the scene was done and Catherine was holding me and you know it was just like it was you don't remember shooting it at all I remember like, shooting the first half, yeah, because we shot it all day. It was like we didn't have a lot of time to shoot the scenes, but for the end of the movie, we had a whole day. It was like that was the only day that we got, like, a lot of time. And um, once the scene moved from the living room into the kitchen, it gets really blurry. It gets really blurry because that's, you know, it's, it's the arm thing and the falling to the floor and the, you know, mm. I just don't. I don't remember. I don't even think that scene was supposed to end up on the kitchen floor. It just kind of just kind of happened a lot in the movie. Like what was yeah. supposed to end up where? And Catherine was so great at just, and so was Elliot, just like bringing that camera wherever it needed to be. 
yeah, they were really masterful and knowing when to come in and when to give us space. And I, yeah, I always give them credit for creating an environment where us as teenage girls felt like we had power, you know? Mm. Yeah. yeah, it was such a new experience for me because I had never acted and I didn't I know. know what I was doing or where I was and, you know, the process of even getting to that place. Did I tell you how I how that all came about? Do you know that story that I was in the because you didn't audition? I mean, you did like a we did like a test thing together, but you didn't go through the typical audition process. So basically, I was given like a an unofficial casting associate credit <laughs> and, or title and I was allowed to take off of I think it was in eighth grade was it seventh or eighth the what was oh, I in seventh, seventh grade. or eighth grade seventh grade, seventh grade eighth. I was allowed to take off school for like two or three weeks to audition with girls because there was no intention of me being in the film but they wanted to have somebody who um could read with the girls in a way that made them feel more comfortable and so I like was so stoked that I just got to take two weeks off school. It didn't even matter. And I went through this whole audition process with all of these girls coming in and they were, they were, they were great. Um, but they weren't the, the Tracy that everyone was looking for, but I somehow ended up at the very last second after we did your screen test, getting asked if I would play Evie, but it was never the, the plan. There was never, yeah, I remember at least not from me. Um, and so the second that came together, it was like, okay, Nikki, now you've got to go. We're going to throw you into acting classes. I think I started immediately with your coach, Andrew McGarrion at the time. And I was kind of just like plucked from this world and tossed into this other world with no preparation, not that you can ever prepare, but that's why the coming together of you and I in that space is so it feels so very different because you also you came with like a craft and training that I didn't come with but also but that's with what made it so real you were you were untainted you know you were just real <laughs> <laughs> I think back <laughs> I think at how um I also how didn't want to how movie with that anybody now. else and I told them that I was like I'm not doing this with anybody really except, yes you were a part of that I, I, I did say, this is who needs to do this. This is what makes sense. This is the best thing for the movie. And I will be much more inclined into the film if this is how it's done. <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't know that. But I felt like I, you know, even in playing Evie, because so many people um, still finished the film and left with the impression that because they saw the word autobiographical next to my name and I was involved in the writing process, they just assumed that that meant I was playing the character that was based on myself. Oh yeah, and that's been confusing. I spent so many years after that and it started with that film actually kind of like chasing an identity um, because I thought that was the, the identity, I don't really know how to articulate this, but I thought that was the identity that I needed to like embody because I was doing things in a film that I hadn't even done in real life yet. Yeah. Which was so strange, I was like, you know, all this, and a lot of the the like drug stuff Evie the character did I I hadn't done myself and mm -hmm. so I wanted so badly to pretend you know by the way like all 13 year old girls right like how many girls you know all of us right you lie about like getting your period before you do oh, and bro. like you're yeah, stuffing your bra and you're doing things that just make you feel like you've lived I years that you never haven't lived. stuffed my bra I never know what you're talking about never. <laughs> And so I felt like 13 was an example of that for me, but like then carried on through all of my teenage years because I had to go and do all this press and do, you know, interview after interview about the integrity of the film. And then right. in that process, bringing along experiences that I hadn't necessarily had and talking about them. Like I remember doing a live radio show and somebody asked me when I lost my virginity and I was so choked up because I didn't know if I was supposed to say they the truth, which is that I hadn't yet, or if I was supposed to lie because that would be How a better look How old were you when they myself. asked you that? I don't know, 15? That is massively inappropriate, I'm just going to say. Like, <laughs> goes without saying, by yeah. the way, goes without saying, but this is also, you know, 17 years ago, you know, we were, right. things were handled differently for sure. Right. But I just remember having all these experiences um, 
in the like PR and press world where I was being asked about things that I hadn't done yet, including things that we were shooting in the film. You know, a lot of the things that we shot were actually firsts for me. And we can like go through what those are, but we did a lot of firsts, you and I together. I mean, you and I made out camera. with a 20 some year old man when we were 14. <laughs> on have, you, have you talked to Kip, by the way? I have not I talked to Kip. No. I haven't talked to Kip. I ran into him like a, maybe a couple times after that, but I haven't, no, I haven't seen him. I just remember us on a, and I don't want this to sound like we were forced to do something that we didn't want to do, but it's, it's a weird thing because obviously we didn't want to do it. It's not something that we would have done in real life, but we knew that it called, the film called for it and that there was an onset teacher, you know, there watching everything. We were, there were certain areas that we were allowed to touch, certain areas we were not allowed to touch. Like everything was being monitored and it was choreographed because they were not taking any chances. But I do remember you and I like standing behind the corner about to go in and do the scene and we looked at each other and we were so nervous. We were like, do this. Oh yeah, I, I do. So right now. <laughs> I know. I was all excited. I thought this was gonna be fun. We I'm were... freaked out. <laughs> we were both so excited. Yeah, we thought Kim was all be and in then the game. we got yeah. completely freaked out when it came right down to it. <laughs> because we had never done it before. No, any never. of those things. No. I know it was like a moment to put our yeah, like put your yeah, yeah. yeah it was weird. It's it's. I didn't want to use that metaphor just now because I felt like that was a weird thing to say. Yeah. yeah, and we had to it, smoke all that fake pot. Which we loved, by the way. We used to, okay, we used to steal we the fake cigarettes that. off of the prop truck. Tea. I'm coming clean about this. We did. Do it. <laughs> I used to go sneak in the prop truck and like take the fake cigarettes that we had to smoke in the movie and go. <laughs> Wait, can you. you tell the story that you told me five minutes ago on the phone that I yeah, totally I can't believe you don't remember this. I didn't. I don't remember this. It very well could be true, and I'm sure you're right that it was my fault. Oh, right? it's true. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Oh, oh, okay. So, well, we did a lot of really amazing things to prep for this movie, including <laughs> Nick, Nick, Nikki and I would go and we would stay at the house that we shot in, and we would go sleep in Tracy's room in the bed together, and we would talk all night. And how many days did we do that? Was I feel that like, like a week. I, I feel like it may have been a week. Or like a weekend. I don't Our know. Our parents like, let us do that? Yeah. It was on and off. I mean, obviously, we weren't unsupervised. It was only at night, you know. Um, but uh, but, our but there was one night. Our parents weren't there, so we were unsupervised. Our parents, our parents weren't there, so it was either Catherine or Holly, I think, stayed in the house with us. Because I don't think we ever stayed there alone. That would have been weird. <laughs> but. I don't remember. <laughs> But um, it was one <laughs> night, and I think it was the, one of the first nights we we stayed there because we wanted the house to feel like our own, and we wanted to get to know it and, and live in it. And so we were actually kind of living in the house. And Holly, I think Catherine said, okay, Holly, you know, go, go have a sleepover with the girls and let us know how you're doing the next day. Um, and so we all went and uh, stayed at the house. And while we stayed over with Holly, we all gave each other makeovers and we put makeup on Holly and makeup on ourselves. And then- Poor Holly, by the way. I know. But we were kind of getting methody. And then, um, I'm not gonna say who, but it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Leaned over and said, hey, we should- I'm gonna steal that for the rest of this. <laughs> she goes, yeah. hey, we should try to get Holly to buy us beer. And I was like, what? I can't and believe it. I was so outrageous. You were ballsy. And we did so proceed ballsy. to try to get Holly Hunter to buy us beer when we were 14 years old. She said no, because God bless her. She's a Good responsible woman, adult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and said, and she went, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't. I, <laughs> I can't do that. And we were like, that's cool. That's cool. It's cool. And then I think we found non-alcoholic beer. Like in a prop truck or in something? In a prop area. And okay. we took that and put it in the freezer and then it exploded. And, and then we got caught. We got caught because it exploded. But we still made it to a gas station. Who took us to a gas station? We took it to a Rite Aid. Oh, to a Rite Aid. Yeah, we went, we, we went with Holly's Holly like, Rite Aid no, dress. Not a gas station. Nothing good comes from gas stations, but I'll take you girls to a Rite Aid. <laughs> she did. Oh and no one blinked because that's Los Angeles. Holly Hunter walked into a Rite Aid with two seemingly underage prostitutes <laughs> because that's how we were dressed. And no one cared. No one really cared. <laughs> but 
totally unsupervised. Yeah. Oh man, there were so many stories like that, which also just brings me back to this feeling of like movie magic that you can't recreate. I mean, no. I love, by the way, structure and all the laws and rules and regulations in this day and age are obviously a wonderful addition. Like intimacy coaching, what a but, concept, you know? Yeah, what a concept. But also just like how wild we got to be and like how much that contributed to like the spirit of the movie and that kind of guerrilla filmmaking and that yeah. Hollywood stay in a house with us. Now you'd have to sign like 86 pages of like, you know, legal documents to, to right. make that happen. But we got to just get to know each other and become a family. It was such a low budget film. You know, if it was a big studio movie, we never would, probably never would have gotten to do that. But you know, that house that we filmed in, they were tearing it down right after we filmed it. I don't remember these things. Yeah, they we were the last people to kind of dwell in that house. And then uh, they let us film there because they were tearing it down. And then, so, you know, the site is still there, but the, the house is gone. It, they tore it down after we filmed the movie, which is kind of sad. Do you know that I'm going to make us take a drive? Yeah, I do when sometimes. I know where the house is. I know where Thank the fence you. is, the long fence. Oh. You know, with the sh the tracking shot, when, when the steady cam was in a shopping cart. That's oh, how yeah. low budget the movie was. We had the DP in a shopping cart for steady cam. <laughs> I do they know what scene you're talking about? Where I think it was just when I was walking hand. along the fence, yeah, with the stick, and then and then Jeremy pulls up and tells me to get in the car right for the the big a shopping house. cart. Shopping cart, yeah. There was Is a Red lot Ball of that. still I mean, on Melrose? Oh, God. You know what I'm thinking as we're talking? I'm thinking it would be so fun if you and I took a full day together, sure, just yeah. got in the car when we're allowed to get in a car together, right. and drove around to each location. We have to kind of wear similar clothes. Like, I should get, like, a short mm. wig. I bet they still have those fake tongue rings. I just had the worst vision of you and I in our low-rise studded leopard, no. leopard stone pants with the, like, thong coming oh. out of the top and the... Like, how similar do you need the wardrobe? Okay, that's a good point. <laughs> Actually, speaking of wardrobe, don't you have a couple of pieces? We were just talking about this. I do. Um, some of them are in storage, but I knew I had one here, and I knew we were doing this, so I dug it out. So you might recognize oh this. God. This was Tracy's pajama top. Oh. And it Let's still see. fits you. With it, you're no, the exact exactly. same size. It absolutely does not. But look, it's got the thumbs cut out remember oh yeah and there were two of them so there's one that doesn't have a bloody wrist and there's another one that has the bloody wrist so this is the one that doesn't of course um, you have the shirt from that scene i have i have i think i have my entire wardrobe from that movie which i know really? the costume department is kicking themselves for now because they get yeah because i asked for it and so i, I moved around so much after that film I just, I don't have a single thing. No. I don't have a single thing. Sorry, I'm not peeing. I'm pouring some tea. I'm not not that I could be that peeing in like a bowl. take more from the set. Like we didn't take any of the, any little souvenirs or anything. That set was just covered. They did such a great job. That whole house was functional. The kitchen was functional. Tra Tracy's bedroom. I mean, they, they actually did have little they made stashes. They made yeah, and little drug stashes were everywhere. Fake ones, obviously, but like they, they, the detail was pretty, pretty phenomenal. They had the. <laughs> well, you know, Catherine's background is in. Um, she was an art director. She was, yeah, she was a production designer, and so she really knew how to like walk in and build mm -hmm. a world, which is part of what I think makes her such an incredible director. Is that you know your brain as a production designer is to like go and see an empty space and then build it out you know, yeah. with your imagination, start to finish. And I think she really applies that in her, in her world as a director. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Should we look at some of these coming in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, how do you even look at the questions? Um, so I think they should be across my face at the bottom. Okay, so I got see it. them like popping up and then yes. you can kind of scroll a little as they're coming in. Hi guys. Um, what is this? What do you think? Here's one. What do you think the ending would have been if Evie did stay with Tracy? Wait, how did you make that pop up? I clicked on it under questions, oh. but I couldn't read the whole thing. Again, this is us trying to be tech savvy and it's not working. 
We're gonna get it together. So what do we think the ending would have been if Evie did stay with Tracy and Mel? Mm. I saw a lot of questions, by the way, about like plot questions and what would have happened if this or that or the next. And I, it's like to to go into that now is so. Um. I think they needed separation for sure. Like I can't imagine Tracy ever. Um, being able to like take ownership of who she is and her path if Evie had stayed in that. Evie was so toxic for the family and for, and I think, you know, I, I do often think about who she would have become, you know, and if we'd been able to like follow her journey a bit. And, you know, there's like the, the option of maybe she really got her shit together and became like a super cool badass woman who took all of her you know crazy childhood trauma and pain and like put it into something amazing you know like she became a child psychologist or something and then right. I think about the other more obvious path um and I'm not really sure where she ended up what do you think Tracy and Evie yeah if, if Evie had stayed I don't know if Evie would have stayed I mean I feel like even if she was invited to stay she probably would have left in the middle of the night or something you know she probably would run away, but yeah, because it got too real. Like they, yeah, I don't know. Like it probably would have. I mean, I think it was bound to kind of self-destruct. But yeah, I mean, hopefully, I don't know. Trace's probably got a couple kids now, and she settled down. And yeah, Evie's probably like a life coach. She probably works with like teenage girls now that like help them get on the right path. That's what I would hope for sure. I got asked about Brooke and who Brooke actually was to Evie because it's true. I guess, you know, she's like references so many different things like caregiver, mom, aunt, friend. Um, and I think we did leave a lot of things kind of vague for a reason. Um, and that's because that's sort of life, you know, like not everything in life is crystal clear and um, not to jump over to this, but the ending of the film is a is a perfect example of that you know we made a distinct choice and, and Catherine really made a distinct choice to kind of end it without anything being wrapped up in a bow because that's life that's life and also the story goes on beyond the end credits you know the real life story goes beyond those end credits and so it just isn't a good representation of real life to have everything kind of perfectly explained because that's where we're at. But Brooke yeah. was, um, Brooke was, uh, I think, like a friend or, a, or an aunt or like a, I'm sorry, like a, like an aunt that she calls her aunt, but it's more like a friend who kind of took her in who maybe was like a friend of her mother's or father's or something like that. And, you know, I, I definitely grew up with um, a lot of those girls who ended up in, and, and boys, sorry, who ended up in situations where like, you know, their parents couldn't get it together or had them you know, at an age where they just didn't feel they could take care of them and they got passed around but didn't ever want to end up in like the foster care system. So you end up with friends of friends of friends. And I think that's Evie's story, you know, but everybody can so quickly become, you know, you see that like that part of her character is such a, it like cracks my soul wide open because I, I, I see that in her, like that longing to just have a family and she can call anybody her aunt or her mom or her because in five minutes you can be that because she just wants that so badly, you know? Right, yeah. Okay, somebody, asked, nice somebody asked if we ever swallowed the tongue rings. Nikki's tongue ring was real. Mine wasn't. I wanted to get it pierced. I know, and I wanted for, you to for, for the movie. movie. <laughs> um, and my mom was like, no fucking way. Um, Thank but, God. Uh, so I, I swallowed one of the fake tongue rings. You did? Yeah. Oh, man. Only one. What were those, like magnets? They were suction cups. It was like a bead. And when you slid it onto your tongue, it like sucked. The and other side of the tongue with it? Yeah, it was like a suction mm -hmm. cup kind of thing. But what about your belly button? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> There's a story in there and it's well, buried. And I, I want to uncover it. <laughs> Well, it kind of it kind of got pierced. It got like by me, half, <laughs> half pierced by you accidentally. I'm so sorry. We were trying to make it look real. Yeah, yeah. They can't. They don't teach you. There's no. Uh, there's no. There's an intimacy coach, but there's no belly button piercing coach. coach. Yeah. There's no. Yeah, and I think they gave us like a real needle. 
Yeah, it was like no a little dull. It was like dulled. It was dull. Yeah, they took a needle and then dulled the top. And they're like, you guys are good, right? And then three, two, one. Come on, Nikki, give it all you've got. I, <laughs> I used to Sorry have a little that. scar there, but I think it's kind of gone away. Sorry about that. No, I, I think we both acci accidentally, excuse me, hit each other once when we were doing the hit. Hit each other? So, oh, yeah, man. I think we both, Did we? we both grazed each other's chins a couple times, I think. I blocked that out too. I'm trying to read some of these. I what totally was Scooby called? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you guys know each other? Um, okay, there's definitely some fun ones in here. There's definitely some stuff we don't need to answer. Um, <laughs> Favorite scene fun. to play? Yeah. Did you click on that again? I just clicked on it. There's a box here with with a with a. How do you click on it? Question mark, and I click on that, Can and then there's questions. Us? Okay, favorite scene. Ooh, you go first. My favorite scene. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what? That's hard. I mean, a lot of them were um, hard to shoot. I think the sprinkler yeah. scene was really fun because they literally just let us loose in a park with a group of kids and turn the sprinklers on. And we were just like rolling around on the grass and laughing and spinning. And that's a metaphor for how we shot the whole movie. Yeah. I mean, everything was just... on the grass rolling around with sprinklers. True. They, they let us go. Um, that one was really fun. Um, you know, the makeout scene was kind of fun. <laughs> Which we had a lot. <laughs> there were a lot of makeout scenes. The one with me and you. <laughs> oh, that one. Yes. Because we laughed a lot. And that, that was one was. of the lighter scenes that we got to do. We did a lot of giggling. Actually, the Polaroid that I, that I put on the internet this morning, um, that was from that scene. That was you and I sitting. Now that I've said that, go That's back and look right. at that Because it's you and I sitting like, um, we're about to do something yeah. we've never done before. <laughs> and it's, like, it's captured and we're both, hold on, I'm going to pull this up like, for you. I'm cool. I'm not, I'm not freaked out. Yeah, this photo of us. So cute. That's you and I going, oh my God. Actually, now that I said that, look at your face. I'm <laughs> like, act cool, act cool, act cool. <laughs> totally. This is stoic. Yeah, that was um that was a fun scene. I feel like we had a lot more fun than we I don't know. This is we my interpretation, fun. but a lot of the heaviness came after for me, whereas maybe for you the heaviness was during filming. Um but I yeah, I had a lot bad. of fun. Do you hear the birds around, by the way? We're totally being I do hear the birds, yeah. Your birds. Um Yeah, we had we did have fun. We we had a lot of fun. And I didn't really have a lot Melrose, of girlfriends all the, like, at the time. What? I didn't really have a lot of friends who were girls. Like, I, I, and, you know, looking back, I'm like, probably because of, <laughs> I had not figured out my sexual identity yet, and they probably scared me to death. Um, I mean, but, you uh, were, we were, in many ways, even though we were little adults, we were kids. We were absolutely kids, yeah. Yeah, we were. But we were really, um... You know, I think what's special about that movie is it gives teenagers a lot of more credit than we normally give them. Um, and it takes them seriously. And I think we write off what's happening with teenagers a lot of, oh, they're teenagers and oh, none of this matters. But it does. It's very real to them. And it's painful. And it's when you're, you know, realizing your place in the world and you're shedding your childhood, you know, and you're going through this metamorphosis and it's, it's, it's painful, you know, change is really painful. And especially as a girl, just, you know, opening your eyes and, and realizing what the world wants you to be and what your mm. place in the world is. And once that starts to come into focus, you know, I think it, it, at least for me, I don't want to speak for everybody, but it really threw me for a loop and a spin when I realized I had to be a certain thing. Otherwise I didn't feel like people were going to like me. When do you feel like you realized, like that was something that became a part of your life? When I, when there was something I had to, I felt like I had to be? Yeah. I felt like I had to, there's a helicopter going over my house, sorry. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think I, I never felt like I had to be something until, probably, well, I don't know, until I was a teenager, until I, I, 
I wanted to find my own identity and it, and it felt like the identity that felt the most authentic to me was going to be unacceptable. Like I remember when I was 15, was it 15? Yeah, I think it was 15. Like most 15 year olds, I wanted to like chop my hair off and dye it black and like get a nose ring and like, I don't know, just, just have autonomy over my body mm. and play. And, and I, and I knew I wasn't allowed that. And that made me feel like there was something weird about me. And it was like, no, you gotta have long blonde hair. You have to be virginal. You have to be perfect. You have to be, you know, classy and beautiful and and um, sinless. And I just knew I was never gonna be able to live up to that because it's not real. A and B, I was a I was a kid and I wanted to be a kid and being you know that's messy. So, and then you know when you're a teenager, that's when you start to realize, oh, you know. I have to be a sex symbol or I have to, you know, there's a certain kind of like you start becoming aware of your sexuality and how it relates to the world and to other people. And I just didn't feel like it belonged to me until I was a lot older. You know, it was a show for everybody else until I kind of claimed ownership for it. I think, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, also so much of your career, um, everyone's career but just because you were talking about it is definitely shaped by uh like what obvious superficial qualities you bring to the table like the color of your hair or like that you know just even in the casting process for yeah. 13 i remember i mean there were many reasons why i should not have played tracy not just this and that's obviously you you were the one for that um for that role but I, i'm just saying before you were even involved one of the things that they made very clear was uh, Tracy needs to be blonde. Yeah. Because that is going to sort of resonate with people. People will identify, you know, the transition of innocence into that darkness. Angelic. If she, if she yeah, exactly. And just physically, um, it was just always so funny to hear that I couldn't physically portray what people would envision um, a character that was based on me. Right. Being, being that I couldn't ever... It was just always such an interesting, and I think yeah. that for me was the first time I had ever realized, because prior to that, you know, this was my, I had never done anything before in the acting space, and that was the first moment for me where I was like, oh, wow, there's, um, there are two parts to this for sure, and one is you have to speak to what people um, can relate to on a, just like a totally, um, you know, surface level. Mm-hmm. Which was so interesting to do that to kids, you know? Yeah. And we, we, because we in the casting like process. We like to pretend that we don't judge things on a surface level, but we do. We all do in some way. You know? We do. And, and there were children involved in that. Like, even in the casting process, listening to people talk about, you know, because I guess they have to, and that's part of it, but just different qualities that, um, you know, some oh, the of these casting young girls would bring in. Yeah. So, so brutal, I think, on so many levels, yeah. because these were, you know, young girls coming in and saying things that and doing things, you know, on camera that I don't know if they'd ever like you and I, I don't know if they'd ever done or were said before. And then to be judged by that, mm -hmm. by your ability to do a good job at that, like, think about what that can do to a young girl's psyche. I mean, I know what it can do because I know what it did to you and I. And it's funny how it manifested so differently. Um, for the two of us, just because we were at very different places in our life. Um, and then how I feel like it kind of the, like the parallels, um, got closer as we got older, but, you know, we were both very much young adults and I was taken like plucked right out of that world. And shortly after that, I moved out and I was on my own and I was, you know, right. It was shortly after that, shortly after I was yeah. 15 or 16 when I moved out and, um, trying to kind of navigate a very adult world as were you, different worlds, but um, this was the catalyst for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, like going question? back to our questions. Although you should do that because you know how to select them and I still can't figure it out. Yeah, I, it may be because I started it, it's... Um... Oh yeah, that's probably why. <laughs> Did you do that? Yeah, okay. I'm just trying to click on random ones. Um, well, besides Nikki, <laughs> I see Catherine every now and then. I have pen palled with Holly a little bit. Mm. Actually, Jeremy Sisto did a voice for Frozen too, so I got to see him. 
<laughs> and yeah, so I was like, oh my gosh, Zen chicken. Um, Zen chicken, Zen chicken. Also <laughs> improvised. Um, and Brady, um, the boy, the boy who played my brother in the film, him and I dated after that movie for about two years. He was like my first love. And now he's directing, he's like a big shot director now. Is that the first time you've said <laughs> Winning, this? Winning like the I gold don't... line, huh? Does anyone know that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we were photographed together a few times, but it's probably not not well known. No, but but we did. We, we, we were madly, madly in love. Um, and we had a, yeah, we had a great time together. Little Brady. <laughs> mm. I want to see Brady. Yeah. I, I, had, I had lunch with him not too long ago. Huh? I can't believe what he's doing. Yeah, he's really killing it. I mean, he was always so, he was younger than us. He was, he was 13 when we were 14, even though he played the older brother. And he was already ready to go. I mean, he knew so much about film and was way ahead way beyond his years and he hasn't changed he's still i swear to god he has just always been that person and that, that's hard brain. yeah yeah really i have kept in touch with holly quite a bit um because she, it's a special part of our family and you know she kept in touch with my mom and they got really close and then she went off and had her her beautiful yes. babies and that was after the film, so I remember there was a lot of talk about that, you know, with my mom, because I can imagine, by the way, being Holly and, and shooting that film and being like, do I want to do this? Do I want to be a parent after this? I mean, it's but really she incredible that she, she was so believable, because I think it's really hard to play a parent when you're not a parent. Or maybe it's mm. not, but I can usually tell when someone yeah. really is a parent and when they're not. And man, she nailed it. She really did. I don't know how yeah, she and I think it. one of the things that she really, um, I think, like, just did such a beautiful job with was, and I've been talking a lot about this lately, which I told you on the phone earlier, so it's, now this is really in my mind, but she kind of danced with, am I a friend, am I a parent, I want to set boundaries, but I kind of don't know how, but I kind of just really want them to love me, and that's my own shit that I'm bringing to the table, and she just did such a good job being that parent friend doing that thing that like, and all parents really want to figure that out because at the end of the day, you just want to have like a great relationship with your kids. And she so just you didn't know what to do. That. She didn't have the tools and she did such a good she job. Tried. I know, that's the thing. It, they did such a good job at humanizing her and showing this. And, and honestly, now that I'm a mom, I, I love what they did with that character even more because she was a whole person. You know, she was a sexual being, she was a mother. She was an, ins you know, she was insecure. She was strong. You know, she had her own history, backstory, you know, with, with the, you know, the, the being an alcoholic and, um, you know, she was, she was a well-rounded mother person, which you never really get to see in movies that much or not a serious or accurate in, uh, interpretation of it. I don't, I don't think anyway, I think it's rare. Um, so I love what she did with that character and I love the way it was written and how she was trying so hard and just, yeah, like you said, just did not have the tools. She did not know what to do, but that didn't mean she didn't love her daughter. So, you know, yeah, she was just so human and so, human. so, yeah. And like all of her flaws were kind of put on display, which by the way, you know, part of why I get asked a lot, like, would I ever be able to make this film now? And I'm, I, I'm curious to hear your answer too on this and what you feel you know, how you would approach it now. But I just, if I had known then what I know now about the repercussions of putting your life on display in such a, you know, it was done in such a like forthcoming. Um, it was shocking, yeah. It was full of, it, and, you know, innocence. And I was totally just naively putting this into the world. But um, what comes from that is so much heavier than I could ever have imagined. And yeah. what I did to my family as a result of that, I think will be the, the, the thing that I'll carry with me forever as, you know, I don't want to use the word regret because I don't really live with regrets in that sense, yeah. but I just, I could never do it again, but I did it because I didn't know. And I was a kid, but I could never do that again because in telling a story that is so 
so human. You have to take humans and put them out there, but you're still telling only one aspect of, it's one perspective. It was my perspective. It's yeah. one dimensional, even though it feels like it's not one dimensional. It is in many ways, you know, it's the perspective of a kid. And that's, you know, what made 13, I think in many ways so special because it had that realness and felt so raw, but I and took, it's a perspective you know, we don't often get to see. Yeah. But if that story got, was able to be told through, you know, um, through Holly's eyes or Jeremy's eyes or any, anybody else, like, or even for Brady's eyes, it would have been a different, yeah. Sorry, I'm not using their character names. I meant Mason. And, but I'm just saying it would have been a different story that we were telling. And, and because it was through uh, Tracy's eyes, it, um, it caused a lot of pain, you know, okay. later on. And I would never be able to do that again. Yeah. I'm glad it happened and it touched so many people, but I would never be able to do that again. Mm -hmm. Well said. Do you think you could do it now? No. No, I, and honestly, I don't think I'll ever be that good again. Like, I think I'm good. Don't get me wrong. But like that, I'm, I'm serious. I really mean this. Because it was pure. It was so pure. And it was when no one really knew who I was. Like, I had some recognition from some shows that I had done. But like, not, you know, nothing compared to After 13. And so there was no, there was no expectation to live up to. And I, I was such a serious little actor kid, as you know, <laughs> you know, like, it was just about the performances and it was just about telling a story and, and working with people like Holly and, um, and it was such a difficult thing to shoot. And it was just, I don't think I could do it again because I wouldn't be able to let go in the same way. Cause I would have all this stuff hanging over my head and all these expectations and, you know, Evan Rachel, you know, I was Evan and then I became Evan Rachel Wood and that's its own thing, mm. you know? Um, so no, it was just, it was pure. Again, it was lightning in a bottle. It's, it's, a, it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing where all the pieces fall, fall together exactly as they should. And I was in the perfect time in my life to be able to draw upon those, those emotions. Um, what and, was that that, like and I had you and you were raw and right there with me and you got it and it was real and I felt safe with you. Which, and I don't think I would have been able to film that movie if we hadn't had that either, you know? What was it like filming the, um, all the cutting scenes for you? That was rough. Um, it was hard, you know, I think I, I, I understood it, you know, I think we've had our struggles with that and a lot of young girls can relate to that. I, it was one of the reasons I took the film was because of those scenes, because it was something that just wasn't being talked about at the time. Um, but something that I understood and related to and that I knew a lot of girls were struggling with, but like, I really didn't think, I didn't know there was a word for it. I didn't know that it was a common thing. Um, so when I read it, I was just happy that, um, people were going to get to see, you know, the dark side to being a, a young girl. Um, and I remember filming those scenes and being in a place. I think I always had to have a family member on set when I did those scenes because I, after every take, I had to kind of go and like bury my head in my brother or call somebody. And I remember just telling mm. Catherine, you know, I'm gonna tell you how this how this works, and just film. And I'll, you know, she should have a she should have a towel in this drawer. She should have the things here. It should be a ritual like she's done this a million times. Like, this is one of the cool things about Catherine is that she listened when it mattered, you know, and when when we related to something and whenever we were allowed to call bullshit on things, I feel like if it didn't feel real to us, we were allowed to say something. And she listened because that's what the movie was about. And she, you know, yeah, there was no ego. No, it, it was about authenticity. And so and again, she was so sensitive to what I was going through in those scenes. Like, I don't even remember her really, I don't remember anybody being in my face. I just remember going to a place and, and doing yeah. it. And, and it was, yeah, it was hard. It was, it was exposing and sad and, but you know, there was something very cathartic about it at the same time. But it's weird to go back and watch that movie. Like I thought for a second we were gonna be watching the 
<laughs> the movie I know. Ball we're doing. That was your idea, and we can't figure out how to do it. I know, I know. We'll do it one day. But to do that would be so, I mean, it's so I really want Sinespia to do a 13 night. I'm just saying. Let's Wait, you want one? one? I really want Sinespia to do a 13 night, like, in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Put it out there. Come on, guys. Like, that would be awesome. And Put I know out there. fans would be digging that, too. Um, can you imagine the photo booths? Come on. Yeah. Let's I get can. on this. <laughs> um, anyway, but I was, like, gearing up to watch the movie. I was like, okay, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, you have I'm, to gear I'm going to have to watch it. 13 today, okay? This is going to be a journey. <laughs> it is. It's always a journey. I can barely Sometimes. make it through the film. I mean, how many times have you – I've only seen it. Honestly, I watched it, obviously, a lot at the time, like, in that one- to two-year period. And then there was, like – I don't know, like a nine year period where I totally kind of like blocked out that whole experience. And then I remember seeing it again. And it was like, literally, like, there were moments where I had to pull a knife out of my gut. I was like, because it just takes your your breath away. And every time I watch that film with a few more years of knowledge under my belt, it's like you see, it's like you bring a different perspective to it. And you're like, Oh, God, now I'm watching this as you know, as an adult or as a, and now I'm watching this as a mom and now I'm watching and you're like, <gasps> you know, you see it with a different lens every yeah. time. Every time. Yeah. And I, I spent know. many years feeling, I think like kind of resentful and angry at what, you know, I, t I talked about that briefly and I, do, I won't kind of, I won't um, dwell on it, but um, like kind of the sadness and resentment that I felt because of the experience later on with my family and and so I spent many years, I think, not wanting to see it for that reason. Like if I ignored it and it went away, then it kind of didn't exist and I didn't do all, you know, I, I didn't create that pain. And then it, it took, um, it took, you know, kind of revisiting that, like with a more peaceful um, relationship with it to go, wow, I see a lot of the beauty and the healing that came from, from that. And it kind of offered it back to me later on in a weird way. But also, you know, I think some of the, the like, the pain I felt went away when you and I became, you know, I, I love that I'm going to talk about this on a live, but I didn't realize how hard it was for me when you and I broke up, you know, we yeah, broke up. It was, it was a teenage breakup. breakup. Yeah. It was a breakup. And there's so many reasons and, you know, you can talk about them if you want or we don't have to, but there were so many reasons mostly to do with, um, it was an unfortunate uh, kind of consequence of like young, young well, after syndrome where we were sort of, you know, big systems like to pit women against each other. They just do. And, like, I think we were both kind of got swallowed up by a sea of weird competition that people had kind of placed on us, which was so unnecessary because <laughs> um, we were kids and we were friends. And, like, it, it, got, it got weird really fast. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, it and my heart was so broken. Yeah. for a minute <laughs> for a long time actually and I didn't realize how long until uh we became friends as adults again and by the way not like there was like a 10-year feud or something weird like that we just after oh, no, we, we didn't have a feud broke up we yeah just we just didn't speak and drifted yeah. away and drifted away we both felt like the other one didn't like the other one and it was and for no reason whatsoever. And I remember when honestly, I honestly it was everybody else's you, drama around us. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally projected on us. But I remember when I reached back out to you actually thinking, I don't know if she's going to respond. And by the way, guys, this is now, I don't know, ten, uh, probably 10, 10 or 11 years ago now. It was in our early 20s that re we reconnected. So it wasn't yesterday. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That was I remember feeling like, is she even going to respond to this or does she hate me <laughs> no. still? And when you came like with huge open arms, like just ready to wrap me up, it kind of hit me that for seven or eight or nine years or whatever, we'd been living with this weird lie that the other person didn't like the other person. And it was yeah. all because of what we were put through doing press together. For yeah, this it's true. Movie. And I think that's also normal for teenagers too. I don't know. I remember going back, um, you know, to like a reunion with a lot of my friends from middle school thinking everybody hated me and nobody did. You know, you just think that you just think that you're just really hard on yourself. I wish everybody could kind of go back and talk to those people because I think you'd be surprised at just how much, you know, is this just a story we tell ourselves in our heads that we're yeah. bad. Um, oh, and wow. either way, like even if you had done something crazy when we were 13, we were 13. <laughs> like, I would never hold anything over your head. 
that happened when we were teenagers. I mean, come on. That's crazy. But I know. Didn't do and I hadn't done anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And ditto. Yeah. It was just a weird thing that happened where yeah. suddenly we went from being friends we got, we got to like into walking system, into. Man. What? We got put into the system. That's what happens. We did. For me, it wasn't so much like I didn't read or see anything. I think there was just like an behind overall, like an energetic, what? More like behind the scenes. Yeah, behind the scenes and like an energetic thing that happened where everyone suddenly would go like, do you guys need separate dressing rooms? Do you guys, is it okay if we announce you at the same time when you walk on stage and all these things that came into it and we're like, what? Like, how is there, what do you mean? Like, why are there rules and why should I not be okay with that? Should she go first? Should I go first? Is there a reason why you're asking that? And then it just, it got so weird. Yeah. Got so weird. Mm -hmm. And here we are now. And here we are now. <laughs> but that was a moment for me, circling back. That was a moment for me, um, you know, when we finally reconnected where I could like reconnect with the film that many years later. Okay, you select questions since you know how. I'm looking. I'm, um, I can't, I don't want to click anything that I can't read the whole thing. Smart. Don't be more scripted or more improv. I mean, we kind of answered that. It was like both. Yeah, I think there were moments where, um, well, definitely, uh, a lot of like the physicality was improvised, I would say. Yeah. A lot of, you know, you, I don't know, how, I don't know if you think, um, just based on your experiences that followed um, on different sets, if you felt like this was unique, but I know um, that every project I was, I was a part of after this film didn't, ha like, you don't get the freedom to like, explore and play oh. and experience cat and because this was my first film i just thought this is how it would always be but Catherine yeah. would literally bring us into a room you me holly jeremy and say like okay guys do it yeah just, just do it do it and then whatever you do we're gonna figure out how to get that later and that was how this film was made and then after that you know you walk onto sets where like directors walk you in and say like, okay, so we've blocked this already. Yeah. And um, here's where you're going to go and what you're going to do. And if you try anything else, we're not going to get that. You know, it was just it so, takes it was all so the creative juices out of the artist when you do that. Like I, yeah. it's a bummer now. I've noticed it too. When you come on the sets and people just block it out for you and tell you what to do instead of asking your input or I don't know is there's an art to that as well by the way and it's it's a nice skill to kind of I guess know and learn and it's like a, it's a very different skill obviously um following direction in that way yeah but well, yeah, I, I feel like it should be a give and take you know it's definitely more of a but it was very specific the way Catherine allowed us yeah. to experience that it was like okay you guys do what you want to do and then we're going to figure out how to make sure that ends up on film Mm -hmm. And film, by the way, we shot on film. We did, and we shot only about nine hours a day because that's all we could work legally. And normally, what is it, 18 hour days or something? And probably all we could afford. Yeah. Film was. <laughs> that's all true. You know. What was the budget on this movie again? Was it like two? Um, no, 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 no. 1.5? It was 1.5. 1.5, yeah. Yeah. I think it was 1.5. And I think I got paid like $700 or oh, something. Yeah for the, the entire summer of shooting and then beyond. And then you like pay taxes on that. And yeah. I remember thinking I was the richest person no in the world because I probably had a hundred bucks in the bank after. And it was so, so exciting. And you got a full new wardrobe apparently. <laughs> well, I, this, I put it in my contract, I think. I think I said oh. that I wanted to keep the wardrobe. I didn't have agents, managers. I didn't have like, there were, yeah. I mean, I'm sure by the end I had a, a contract, but it's just amazing to see like, I, you know, I was just, it was literally like a whirlwind experience. Just whoop, there you go. Yep. And then it came yes. out. Oh, look, the questions went up into your bubble now. Into my bubble? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of Dolores. Um, what's your favorite memory? What was the hardest scene to film? Hmm. <laughs> what was your favorite music track? Ooh. Oh. 
there is some really good music in the movie. Yeah, do you know the story? I mean, Catherine fa put that together in the same way that she kind of put the rest of, yeah, you know, okay. You should talk about that for no, a second. No, 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 you do, you do. So, well, I, I don't remember, my memory is obviously not as crystal clear as yours, but I just remember Catherine um, sort of handpicking these artists that yeah. really, they needed this as an outlet as much as the film needed their work, you know? It was, and it was it, like, um, what's her name? Can you remind me, Katie? Rose? Katie Rose, who's right? so brilliant. Yeah. Yes, Katie Rose. And she, I think she was our age too, or, or definitely a teenager. She was, she was young. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was also really incredible, Catherine. Liz Fair. Liz Fair. That song at the end. Every time I hear that, it just gives me like a very specific feeling in my heart because it meant that the we went to so many screenings of that film. Every time I heard that song, it just meant the movie was over and I knew that the audience was reeling because we would always walk in after mm -hmm. people had seen the film and it would just, no one could breathe. And we would always come in and give people permission to breathe. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, we'd say, okay, you can breathe Wow, I have now. so much blocked out of my head. That's... Yeah. We did um, so many Q and A's where we would walk into a theater and like, no one was cla no one was moving and no the whole thing it was like they were holding their breath yeah 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 it was really you could just feel it in the theater you could feel it and i haven't really had that experience with another film i mean kind of but not like 13. i mean really it was palpable it was just one of those it was just one of those things um i also really love the um back to the music question the clinic song was that brady's idea clinic it was. It was. he had really good taste in music um and that song the song where we're all tripping on acid i think it was acid we're supposed to be on acid by the way again like at the time we just <laughs> we were like is this what this okay great what are we doing we're just all right yeah that's what it felt like i remember being handed straws like okay you're gonna snort this in this we were snorting I've never done that before yeah we were we did this scene where we had to crush up the fake pills and sort them and it was lactate lactate pills or something milk powder probably yeah I, I was gonna say sweet and low but no <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> maybe that's what I what I did and you know to look cool as a kid in real life I'm not sure <laughs> right yeah yeah the music Catherine was uh really um collaborative in that sense like how cool that she even allowed Brady to have that kind of input it's just not allowed, that's not the right word. Welcomed, asked, yeah. you know, all of us to have that kind of input. Very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Part of the process. Wild. Yeah, it was sort of magic. <laughs> I don't even know how to, should I go into these questions that I, that I saved? And yes, yeah, so you can come out, right? Yeah. Now we've been chatting for so long that they, we might have, I'm not sure, maybe we answered some of them. Oh, you know what, they're on my, they're on that. They're on the phone that we're using. You're on my you're on my iPad and I have my phone. I did like did I tell you I read this oh I read this to you on the phone but I thought it was really um, really sweet from Waterhouse. Uh, dear dear girls, have you thought about making the sequel? And what if in the sequel Tracy is a good therapist who meets Evie who is still a troubled woman? What would Tracy do and would she forgive her and how would she help her? I thought it was a sweet way to kind of like crack open the story in a different way just to think about who those women could have become and what they you know what that relationship would be yeah later on um and then you said something really great to that which was what if evie was the therapist and tracy came in and had to sit down on that couch and they connected in that way yeah tracy was the one that was all messed up still there are a lot of sequel questions in here um and, you know, of course, I mean, obviously there, there's no sequel that will no. ever happen, but there's the thought of like who, you know, we talk about that a lot, which is very fun. Just We missed like, our opportunity to do 31 because <laughs> I think we're both older than 31 now, barely. Or, I mean, I'm still 31. You're 31. 31. <laughs> so, you know, just keep it. But we were a year older than 13 when we made 13. So that's true. If you want to put on, if you want to share some of your wardrobe that you have from uh, from your behind the scenes. All I have is this. <laughs> like, can you, no, you have a whole storage unit. 
I do, but it's not my mom's. I'll have well, you the next time. My mom has the No, control. not right now. I mean if I come over when we're allowed to when quarantine is over, we can put oh, all of our oh wardrobe gosh, and drive to each Absolutely. place and that can be the sequel I'm saying. We can just recreate <laughs> that's the sequel. It's just us going Okay, yeah, that'll be it. That's look it. at this though. Look how short look at this. It was a crop top at the time. It was. It? Yeah. It still fits you. What are you trying to say? I no. I have not put it on <laughs> and I don't know if I can. You should put it on. I don't know, man. It's like I mean, not on camera, but you should put no. it on. <laughs> but it's I don't know. That's of all the things you could have right now, that's a pretty wild piece to have. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, this by the way, a few people like, are saying 31 would be super cool. 33 huh? would be super cool. 31. 30? I'm getting a lot of 31 and 33s. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest film, the hardest film, the hardest scene to film. I do have a lot of those. And how do you think this film would affect today's generation? Um, oh, God. I mean, I can't How is this therapeutic? I think we did kind of went through that. The piercing scenes. Um, who would win a fight? Don't need to go there. Did we stay close? We talked a lot about that. Um, a reunion, we're kind of doing that. Our favorite memory together. Oh, we could do an entire, <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. a, that's another day. Yeah. Um, yeah, this movie still fucks with my head. Evie sucked. I, hey, I, give her a break. I, yeah, <laughs> but I hear you fucking with your head. Yeah. Um, Ooh, what do you think about this movie and the character's behavior now that you're parents yourself? That's an interesting one. Um, anything jumping out to you? Well, I mean, you kind of touched on it, talking about Mel's character and just being able to see now that she just didn't have the tools. And again, like, kids are smart. Teenagers are smart. Yeah. And they feel a lot. And we don't, get, we don't allow them that. And we don't validated and we don't we're afraid to talk to them and honestly i feel like by the time they're teenagers it's already too late we should be having these conversations with them way earlier um how like what age pairing them i mean things that are age appropriate but i feel like you need to be i don't know from the reading that i've done and the research that i've done you know i obviously my child is not a teenager yet so i don't know i can't speak from from experience yet but but there are things that i feel like we should be talking about earlier and especially with girls and just preparing them and um you know trying to outrun some of the brainwash the societal brainwashing that happens you know and just not being afraid to have uncomfortable conversations you know i think we're that was a huge terrified part to talk the, to each other the media influence was a was a kind of very subtle um but important part of the like undercurrent of that film because you know we were in the right in the heart of Hollywood um, and this was a film about girls being raised in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of concern that it would the specificity of that wouldn't feel relatable but the truth is like the billboards and the like constant subconscious influence of who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to I can only well, imagine look now like, yeah being a 13 year old girl with social media and the people who are supposed to be and like those those filters that we saw that through were filters that had to like sure billboards and things like that but now all day every day people are looking at like photoshopped images and filters across stories and who you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to put that image out there like talk about fucked up you were talking about an image that you had to put out there because you were an actress and had eyes on you but now now that, it's that's kind of every, every young girl is doing. that some way yeah like they have an image that they have to feel they have to create yeah. And, and instant all feedback day, every from day. people. I just can't imagine. I can't it's imagine actually that. too dark for me. I can't even go there when I start to think about how. No, it's sad. How are these, how are these young people? How, I mean, I guess we can ask you guys, but how are you going to navigate that? And to me, the only way to do that, honestly, is to leave, leave. social media and not be an active participant in, in that exchange of like, here's who you need to be. And here's how I'm going to present that to you. I just don't think like the development of a young girl, I just don't know how to. Yeah, it's a scary That's the thing. message for all of the young girls watching. I don't know if, yeah. if the demographic watching this is like 
our age and I know saw the film. Also, I saw a comment about boys too, and I want to say I I do I I have a son, and and what I said about the conversations also applies to boys, not just girls. I I, I focus right. on girls because it's thirteen. The movie, it, the, yeah, it's how it relates to the yeah. film. But I one hundred percent believe that we brainwash boys just as much, and yeah. and and that you know we're all kind of fall prey to a society that tells us who we should be and how we should act and it's uh become very toxic <laughs> i do think that obviously it's important to put um you know shine a light on both but i do think i have to say just watching um and and working so closely with so many young girls after this film because you know i did a lot of yeah. um, like mentoring and a lot of and i do feel like there is a specific kind of pressure put on girls that um I don't want to say outweighs, but um, it's definitely specific different. to women. Oh yeah. yeah, it's different. It's different, yeah. It's different. And um, I think maybe we should be taking some time to like really talk about and explore what that is for boys since we do spend a lot of time as a culture maybe acknowledging that for young girls. That's, that's totally Absolutely. true. But I think it'd be um, important for us to learn about the other's experience too. Like I think young boys yeah. should learn about a young girl's experience and what it's like to be a teenage girl and, and, and young girls should learn about, you know, the male experience as well. I think that we're probably more alike than we realize in certain ways, you know, but we're divided so quickly, you know, we don't know how to relate to each other anymore. Well, we don't see each other. We're not connecting in person. There is such a lack of empathy and compassion and understanding because honestly, it's hard to understand people in, you know, a one or two dimensional form you know and connecting through screens like there's a lot of beauty in the internet and that kind of connection of course but i think in many ways it's caused us to dis disconnect um and especially with with feelings and emotion because of the lack of consequences you know mm -hmm. that's the one thing like i when i do think back at the film and the girls and how that you know there's a lot of pain of course in their relationship and dynamic and how much evie you know hurts tracy tracy throughout but there's also a lot of like face-to-face -face acknowledgement of that pain. And when something went wrong or something happened, um, there was a way to like confront that um, and not hide from that, from that, that pain that you're causing someone, you know? Mm -hmm. And you learn from that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I saw a good one. Somebody just said, I'm the father of two girls. And do you have any advice for a father with two girls? Mm. How old are your girls? I think it said they were teenagers, but I'm not sure. Be mm. present. Yeah. Just let them know they're loved. Because bad things are going to happen to them. It's just inevitable. And I, it's true. I mean, it, it, girls are going to get hurt. And boys are going to get hurt. And, you know, the world can be wonderful and beautiful, but it can be cruel and as long as you have people that love you unconditionally, I feel like that's everything. I feel like it's actually really simple. You just have to let people be who they are and be there when they mess up. And I always tell, I do tell people this sometimes because I felt like I was kind of too sheltered. Um, mm. This is just my experience though. Again, like you said, my parents' experience would probably be different, but, but I wish I was allowed to mess up more when I was a teenager and I was safe under my parents' roof rather than, you know, this abstinence only kind of approach of, well, just don't do it. It's like, well, but I'm gonna do kind it. Of so very different childhood. You know what I mean? Just prepare me for it. Cause I'm gonna do it. You know, it's gonna yeah. happen. And like, I wanna have an honest conversation about it and not feel bad for acting my age and for messing up and for getting messy. And I, and I would hope that, you know, I could come home to somebody who, who wouldn't judge me and who would understand. That doesn't mean you let everything slide. You know, but sure. I think I think it's okay for teenagers to fuck up, you know, and, and you just have to be able to have real honest conversations about it and not shame them for it and it, and validate their feelings. And, you know, no one's ever going to get it right or perfect, you know, and, and again, bad things will happen. But, you know, I've heard that people really just need one good parent, you know, as long as you got one good parent on your side that loves you and is there for you, you know. Yeah, but I do think that the opposite sex relationship with the parent is important. a very, um, plays a really um, important role in 
in development and of course you know love is love so if you have one great parent yeah of course that's I mean that's more than you could ever you know need or hope for but I also think um for me personally uh and I try not to talk about my my um my family too much anymore <laughs> I learned <laughs> very quickly from this but um <laughs> I definitely had a more strained relationship with my father when I was a kid. And then as I got older and I found my way back to that, uh, not only did we repair our relationship, but we um, like really developed a special, a special bond that I think informed all of my decisions going forward about my own self-worth. And um, it's amazing how, how quickly just having that um, can like heal every wound. It's, it's taught me a lot as a parent, I think, just how um, how love can like kind of heal almost anything and so quickly too, you know? Mm -hmm. Being there and being present is uh, what you just said is the best. I couldn't answer that, that man who asked that question any better than you did because I think that is it. It's just being present and, and letting them feel like they're heard and yeah. hearing them, not just allowing them to feel heard, but actually hearing them. Actually hearing them, giving them a voice, yeah letting them have autonomy. Yeah. yeah. I'm reading through these two. There's absolutely hope for damaged parental relationships. I just saw somebody say, wow, there is for sure. It's never too late. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if both people are open, I agree. You know, aside from like really abusive situations where you need healthy boundaries and that's something totally different, but you know, I, my hope is that wow. it's never too late. Podcast? I know. I saw that. And I was like, oh, that's actually not a bad, <laughs> an <laughs> interesting idea. <laughs> I mean, if people like, want to see what you and I talk about on place. FaceTime <laughs> all day, every day, then maybe. But I have to warn you guys, it's mostly gardening and herbs. Yeah. It's, 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 so it's, Evan it's, got an herb garden. And she knows that this is this is a big deal to me. You've now graduated into a little gardener. Um, so that's what we talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're what we going to do it. Have you had experience with drugs or alcohol before the movie? I think we talked about that. Um, can you speak gibberish though? What a great question. Oh, to go get a guess, put a geek, get a gan, get a guy, get a gink. What a guy, get a guy. What a guy, get a guy, get a guy. We haven't done that in 17 years. <laughs> and that's also in the movie because we were doing that on set. And then Catherine was like, what's that gobbledygook language you guys did? Do that, do that. Is that how that happened? She called it gobbledygook, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's how that ended up in there. Yeah. Ooh, back to the podcast. I don't know, 13 going on 31. Get it? Do. <laughs> so sweet. I do. I, it's so sweet to see how many of you have actually seen this film and And how many have it and are now going to go watch it. That's exciting. Good luck. <laughs> That's true, too. I've seen, a, I've seen a few of these. Yeah. And herbs. Let me just define herbs really quickly because I've seen a couple of those comments. She's oh, growing yeah. calendula. Yeah. And uh, rosemary. And she sends me pictures of all of her little seedlings I and asks me how much to water them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I help her make balms out of them. Balms. That's what we do. Yeah. Balms. <laughs> we went from bongs to balms. Yeah, balms. That's right. That will be. <laughs> that's the bottom of the. That's, that's the short word. That's the podcast today. name. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. From bongs to balms. Oh, God. <laughs> this is so sweet, you guys. You guys are so awesome. Hi, Thanks for tuning in, man. Yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. Man, I just said, man, like 2,000 people. I don't know. Do you still remember some of the lines? So many. Oh, oh yeah. No bra, no panties. Oh, that's Jesus. Probably, that that's is the fun, one that haunts me. You know, people, do you, is it? People say no bra, no panties to me all the time. Really? Like they walk up to you on the street all the time. and say that? Yeah. Um. I'm like, that. Um. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's um, also saw that's I, definitely a rough one if you're having like tacos with a friend on a yeah. Tuesday night and that's what someone chooses to come up and say. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Um I wonder if anybody has any thirteen tattoos. 
Oh. Do you? I don't. I have tattoos, but not any that not I was too young. Yeah. Actually, I think so. I think I've seen, um, how would I find that now? Well, I guess I could ask if any of you do tag us in a photo of it and we would see it. But yeah, I have seen throughout the years. Tag I've seen a photo. I didn't my phone's gonna die. Don't let me. Your phone's gonna die? Yeah, my portable charger's dying. <laughs> I told you that was going to happen. I know. Well, that's why I've been <laughs> charging it. But <laughs> Well, I love you. Love you. When you charge your phone, call me in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> recap on this. This was really fun. We didn't get to any of the questions that um, oh. I promised. But I know, I feel like somewhere in there we covered most of these. And thank you guys so much for, for tuning in and being a part of this with us. That was a good line of yours. Mothers lock up your sons. That's oh, that <laughs> haunts me. I feel like I'm oh, no bra, no panties, and your mother's lock up your sons. I didn't mean it, you know? Mm. I didn't mean it. That was a Catherine line, actually. Do you remember that? Wait a minute, Things I said I that mean... line. I thought you said that line. That. Right? Oh, I said the line before that, and you said that line, but that was a Catherine line. Right. That was when we were walking down Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, we were really walking down Hollywood Wait, Boulevard. Wait, who said that? I feel like maybe it was me. There's a bird behind me. I feel like it was me. We'll, well I don't watch know, the film watch together. It. We'll watch it together. We were like arm in arm. This one, we had the, like the dreads and- Yeah, I was lighting a cigarette. Or not the dreads, the corners. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Oh. Okay. The times. <laughs> I never know how to end these things, so. Literally how to end it? I think we pushed some X's. Or do you mean, like, what to say when you're ending? I I'm think we, say uh, when, we're, when we're ending. We love you guys. Uh, someone, someone said that you said that line, so it was you. Okay. But I'll it still haunts me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much for um, for chatting with us. This is um, her and I are a little speechless still when we talk about this because there's actually so much that we can. I mean, it's just such a huge part of our lives forever and something that neither of us have really been able to kind of, I don't know, move past because it just lives with us. So it was a part of us, you know. Yeah, it, it, always it still will. is. It's a big part of us that we just kind of took out and putting in the world now it's got a life of its own it has a life of its own yeah there i that's the only um movie post i have that poster in my um in my house it's actually in my garage now i just moved it but Aww. um i walk by and it's like you and i you know four feet tall um with our tongues sticking out and i still am like i can't believe <laughs> just that visual i mean it's all so jarring it's just so yeah. Rah, Remember the first time I face. saw this poster, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. And then we continue to have a bunch of oh, shit moments forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about the Kip scene, it kind of brought up a lot for me because I haven't thought about that whole process and what that was like to film that scene in forever. And just, you're totally right. We, like, we spent all this time thinking it was going to be, like, so fun and so cool. And we were so excited because I think we both thought he was super hot. I'm sure we did. Yeah, we were all talking. We were and, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and playing it cool. And even I think with each other, we were probably, like, you know, wanting to make sure the other person knew that we had. We that probably we were totally cool. Yeah. Yeah, totally cool. That. And then getting there and neither of us, and especially for me, there was always so much pressure on me to look like I knew what I was doing, you know, because right. Evie knew what she was doing and right. she was like the influence and she, and I was just terrified. Just terrified. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were there. We were, we were, we were in the trenches together. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, though. Okay. And love to our on-set teacher, really Honoré. 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 Yeah. Yeah. She was great. Honoré. She kept us safe. She did. She did. This is so <laughs> sweet, you guys. Love you Thank guys. You. I wanna, I, I feel like you. I should end Bye. before it dies, but I could talk to you all day. So. Bye. Love you. I'll talk to you when your phone charges. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.